We'll be wrapping up our time in John chapter 11, so please join me there. Our focus today is going to be from verses 45 to 57, so we'll, as I said, we'll be finishing up this chapter that we've been in for a few weeks now. I hope you're there, we'll read it, we'll ask for the Lord's help, and we will, by His help, seek to understand it. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what He did, believed in Him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness, to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples." Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word, Lord, I pray that you would help us at this time to understand that every single word is inspired by you, that every word of Scripture is meant to teach us something about ourselves and something about you, something about what you have done. So Lord, I ask that you would help us this morning, not just to hear a sermon, but that from your word that we would hear from you. Lord, I ask that you would do infinitely more than we can ask or think at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. The end of this chapter marks a pretty major movement in this gospel. As you may well remember, There are seven signs in the Gospel of John, and we have just seen the seventh and final sign in the raising of Lazarus. And I think that sometimes when we come to, you know, a passage like what we looked at, just just read, sort of like the end of of, of a book of the Bible, it's easy to kind of think to yourself, well, the good part's already done, he's just kind of wrapping up a few loose ends, and then we're going to move on. But as you read through here and you look at what John has included by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit uh, at the end of this chapter, you realize that there's actually still so much here. These words are still very important. And as I said, this is marking the, the, a shift, a, a major movement in the Gospel of John. Uh, if for no other reason, we're not going to see any more signs being performed by Jesus We've already seen the last one, and if you can hopefully remember, I don't know, John, uh, Jacob tried to quiz everybody this morning, and it was um, a little disheartening that nobody knew. So let's hear it again one more time. The reason for this book is written in John chapter 20. John says, many other signs were performed, but these are written so that There we go. That was great. 
so that you may believe. Every one of these signs that John has written is here so that you may believe. So the first sign in chapter 2 when he turned the water into wine, the purpose of that ultimately was so that you would believe. In chapter 4, when he healed the official son, the ultimate purpose, so that you would believe. Chapter 6, when he multiplied the the fish and the loaves, what's the ultimate purpose? So that you would believe. And on and on and on, especially here in John chapter 11, when we see the resurrection of Lazarus, the ultimate point is so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, but not just believe mere facts about Him, not just believe that He did powerful, mighty works, but so that you would have life in His name, so that you would have saving faith. This is such a major change in this Gospel that from chapters 1-11, through John has covered basically two years of Jesus' life. In chapter 12, we see Jesus ride into Jerusalem, which commences the final week of his life. And in chapter 13, John slows down even more. Chapter 13 takes place the night that Jesus was betrayed. How many chapters are in the Gospel of John? There's 21. So the rest of the book is going to take place over a matter of hours. This is a major change right now in the Gospel of John. We can't miss this text. John has written all of the signs that he intends to to write by the inspiration of the Spirit to point us as the reader to the reality of who Jesus is one more time so that we would believe. And since this chapter ends with Jesus no longer walking openly among the Jews... We have to ask ourselves, how did the people of Jesus' day respond to these signs that John records for us? As we have already seen, there's a lot of division over who Jesus is and what to do about Him. We'll see in our passage, though, that a plan for what to do about Jesus is officially crafted, and there is finally agreement among the religious leaders that this Jesus must die. Think of it. The one who just raised someone from the dead, who gives life and is life, must be put to death. As I studied this passage, I really couldn't help but to be amazed by the reaction of the Jewish leaders. Not that it's anything new. We understand that they hated Jesus every step of the way. But think of all of the mighty works that Jesus has performed just in this gospel, just the seven that we have in this gospel, not even including all of the other works that he did, and they all culminate in him raising someone from the dead. This this is an amazing miracle that he has performed. But they not only want to kill Jesus because of all of this, They think they're powerful enough to do so. Can you imagine having that kind of pride? That you have witnessed Jesus perform miracle, irrefutable miracle after miracle after miracle. You've just received news that He has raised someone from the dead and you think that you have the power to put Him to death. It reminded me a lot of Psalm 2 that Brother Jacob read for us. In case you were wondering, why this for our Scripture reading? It's because of the question that the psalmist asks, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth, they set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. Who is that? That's Jesus saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. But God's response is epic. He who sits in the heavens laughs. He laughs at these puny attempts. 
All of the people of the world, all of the rulers come together to plot against Yahweh and His Christ, thinking they are mighty enough to break free from His power. And how does God respond? He laughs. He doesn't wring His hands and say, well, what am I going to do now? He, he, he doesn't say, all right guys, back to the drawing board. We didn't plan for this one. That's how you and I respond. But God, because of His great unsearchable power, sits back and laughs. Look at these guys. Look at what they're doing. They're all gathered to go ahead, go ahead, gather together. So we ask as we walk through our text and see man's attempt to rule over God, who is really in control here? Because you might be thinking to yourself, but Matt, they do kill him. You're right. Because God ordained it to be so. Otherwise, it never would have happened. So we have to ask, who's really in control as we walk through this text? Who's really in control as they're gathering together to make all of these plans? Who's really in control? Is it the leaders? Or is it someone else? I pray that the answer to that question and I want to focus on that question, so it's the title of our sermon if you want, if you want something like that. Uh, I, I pray that the answer to that question not only ignites worship in our heart towards God, understanding His sovereignty and His power, but that it also gives us great comfort for whenever we encounter trials of various kinds. So let's begin by looking at the division over Jesus. Last week when we left off, Lazarus was just raised from the dead. And we noted that John doesn't record for us any reaction from the sisters or from Lazarus himself. We don't even get so much as like, a, hey guys, it's me, Lazarus. We don't get anything. It's just unbind him and then we move right along. We do, however, have some of the reaction from the crowd that was gathered around. John effectively tells us that there's a division among the people who were gathered together there who witnessed this miracle. This is just such an amazing example of the hardness of the human heart. You just watched him raise someone from the dead with a word. And there's a division over who he is still? There's still any question or any doubt that he is who he says he is? Yeah, there is. But it shouldn't exactly be surprising. We've seen this a few times in this gospel already, haven't we? Jesus' words and works often created division among the people. His works created division. His works didn't actually create the division. His works exposed the division that was already there because of His words. People hated what Jesus had to say. And they're free to disobey and they're free to move on about their life until He puts a seal, an official seal, showing forth His power that gives some oomph behind what He has said with His works. His works were meant to prove that He is who He says He is. So they see the works and they say, well, this is irrefutable. I just, I know that man has been blind from birth. I know that invalid was an invalid for 38 years. I know that. And now he can walk? Now he can see? I know that man was dead in the tomb for four days and now he's alive? Well, now I'm forced into a corner where I have to do something about what Jesus has been saying. He's not just a lunatic because he has the power to perform miracles that no one has ever had. So we're not surprised about this division we're not told explicitly that some believed and some didn't, but we're told that many believed and then some went to tell, G tell on Jesus to the Jews. The implication is that many believed, some didn't. But isn't it great to finally see not that some believed and many didn't, but that many believed and some didn't? I mean, how could you not? This man has just walked 
out of the grave. They have seen that he has the power and the authority to bring someone back from the clutches of death. Even death itself must listen to the voice of Christ. That means I do too. If he can bring someone back from the dead by his command, then when he commands me to do something, it means I must listen. How is it that so many of us are still more disobedient than death was at that moment? How could you not believe? There will always be some who will hear of Jesus and His work, and they are convinced of the truth of who He is. And there will always be some who hear of Christ's ability to bring dead men to life, and they will believe in Him. And then there are others just like in our text, who will never believe even if they were to see a dead man come back to life. J.C. Ryle said it really well. The same fire which melts, melts wax hardens clay. The same fire which melts wax hardens clay. It's a really pithy statement to talk about how it is that in the same crowd witnessing the same event, different things are happening in the heart. It's because the same fire that melts wax softens the heart to make it ready to believe and eager to believe hardens this other heart that refuses to believe. The other Jews who were there went to tell the Pharisees what had just happened. They told them about how Jesus would dare raise someone from the dead. Can you believe this guy? Evidently, it was common knowledge that the Pharisees are not fans of Jesus, so this group of people thought the Pharisees would definitely want to hear about this one. Get a load of this guy. Raising people from the dead, can you believe it? We have a great misconception in our day that unbelievers just need to see a miracle to believe. If they could just see God do something amazing in their life, then they would believe. No, they wouldn't. This man walked out of the tomb and people left harder of heart, more hardened in their heart than ever. It's much like the parable of the rich man and Lazarus from Luke chapter 16. Do you remember the story? There's a rich man who had a wonderful life. There was a poor man who had a terrible life. They both perish. The rich man goes down to Hades. The poor man is in at Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom. The rich man is burning and he cries out, Father Abraham, would you send someone to just dip their finger in the water and just put it on my tongue? I'm in, I'm in great anguish. And he says, no, you, you, you've had your good life and he had a bad life. He's getting his reward now. Plus there's this great chasm between us that no one can pass. And then he says, Well, then at least send someone back from the dead who can tell my family that this is real and they should really believe. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. No, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. That's exactly how we think. If they could just see an amazing miracle, then they will repent. What did Abraham, how did he respond? If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And you would hear that parable and say, come on, yeah, right. Someone rises from the dead and you're not going to believe, and then you turn to John chapter 11 and you see that exact thing happening. Someone rises from the dead, and there are still some who don't believe. The human heart is so naturally hardened in unbelief that not even something as amazing and miraculous as a dead man coming to life can soften the heart to bring about saving faith. It must be a work of God. Friends, for your brothers and sisters, for your friends, for your family members, for your co-workers that you want to see come to saving faith, the one thing they need to have happen is God to work in their heart. They need God to bring them from death to life just like He has done for you. That must be your prayer. God, give them life. Not God, help them get their act together. 
God, help them to make better decisions. No, God, give them life. Help them to see. That has to be our prayer because that is the great need of every human. Let's look at the conspiracy against Jesus. Verses 47 to 53 is our focus. Jesus will not actually be brought before Pilate or the council for another few chapters for his trial. But here in these verses before us, this is where we see Jesus' true trial. And he's not even there to defend himself. They're having a trial about him, and he's absent. They make a guilty verdict, and he's absent. What does that tell you about their heart? How hard an unbelief it is. We know Jesus did not break any actual laws, but the Jewish leaders by this point are so fed up with him, and they must act. Jesus poses a major threat to everything they love. Not everyone they love. Everything they love. Namely, their place of honor and authority over the Jewish people. We see here in verse 47 that the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council. This is a meeting of the highest authorities in the land, outside of the Roman Empire, of course. The word council here in the original, and it might be in some of your Bibles, is the word Sanhedrin. You would recognize that word from other places in the Gospels, where you read about the Sanhedrin gathering and doing such and such. The Sanhedrin was made up of 71 members. The high priest at the very top, and then some of his family, and then Pharisees, and then other various religious leaders of the day. They were the preeminent authority in Judaism. The Sanhedrin was at the tip top of the mountain. Okay, this, I stress that to say, this is a major meeting. This isn't anymore just a bunch of guys kind of grumbling together outside the temple. This is a very serious meeting with the real power brokers of the day who can actually make something happen now. You remember other places. This isn't the first time that we hear of them wanting to put Jesus to death. We've seen it multiple times throughout the gospel. But those were just little pockets of people frustrated and angry and saying we need to do something. But now they are finally gathering together and they're asking themselves, what are we to do? In other words, guys, what are we doing? We cannot let him continue like this. We got to do something about him. We can't continue to sit idly by, just huffing and puffing angry about what he's doing we have to do something because if we don't we will lose everyone to him everyone will believe in him and then what the romans will think that we are putting together an insurrection and they will come and they're going to take over the temple and take over the people then what will we do you can see how much hatred they had for jesus here because what stirs this up Is Jesus bringing someone back from the dead? This is why I say it wasn't just the works themselves that divided. The works exposed the division that already existed on account of Jesus' words. They hated what Jesus said. They hated what Jesus taught. Why? Because He attacked their self-righteousness. Jesus came against every reason that they had to feel assured of their faith. He came against everything that they believed was the reason that made them good people earning heaven. He attacked all of it. So they hated Him for that. And again, when He performed works, He started to show forth that His words have to be heard. If the elements, if death must listen, so must I. And people rebel against that. I want to make six observations, hopefully quickly, in this little section. First of all, I want you to notice the hypocrisy. If they were really worried about the Romans coming in and taking over, just think about it. 
If they're really worried about the Romans coming in and taking over, if that's their true concern, if they were really concerned for the people, that is, then don't you think they ought to think through perhaps joining the side of the one who can raise the dead? Hey, maybe we should team up with him. And even if the Romans come, we have the one who can raise the dead on our side. What are you going to do? Oh, you have chariots? Great! He can raise the dead! But of course, that's not even a consideration. Their minds, even before this trial, are already made up. There's nothing that could happen here that would sway them to believe in Jesus. No, I think that the real reason they bring that up is because they don't want to lose their place of power. Notice what they said, that Rome will come and take their place and their nation. What they're first concerned about, the place is the temple. What they're first concerned about is the place where they have honor and authority in the, in the land. They're going to lose their place of privilege if the Romans come in. Notice second, the irony of this statement. They're afraid of the Romans coming and taking over their place, which is a reference to the temple again. And so they think they have to do something about Jesus so that the Romans won't come and take over. If you know a little bit about church history, you know that in A.D. 70, it was a major, major event. These people thought if they will kill Jesus, they will keep the Romans away. But actually what happened is they killed Jesus, and so as judgment against Judaism, God in A.D. 70 sent the Romans to do what? To destroy the temple. They destroyed it. What great irony there is here. If we just kill Jesus, we'll be safe. The Romans will stay away from us. But the reality is that in killing Jesus, that is what caused the Romans to come and attack. Because it was a judgment of God. God used Rome to execute His judgment on this dead religious system. Notice third, the futility of this statement. They said, I I honestly laughed when I read, if we let him go on like this, I'm sorry, what do you mean let? He just raised the dead. And you think you're letting him do this? What can you do? What kind of power do you have? This is similar like, to the first point. He raised the dead. I'm, I'm sorry, but at that point, you are stronger than everybody. You have proved your point. You are the alpha of alphas, if you will. You are it if you raise the dead in front of everyone. But not only that, all of the miracles that he has performed... But here they think that they have so much power, their brains are so broken, that they drastically overestimate their own ability and drastically underestimate Christ's authority. They think they're going to be able to take control of this situation. They clearly did not hear Jesus when He said in chapter 10, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. In that, he's giving us a little sampling of what's going to happen. He's going to lay down his life, when the Jews do inevitably succeed in killing Him, it will not be because of their authority and their power. It will be because Christ laid down His life. And to prove it, He's going to take His life up again. He's going to be raised from the grave. So if their plan will succeed, it will only be because Christ has chosen to let it succeed. 
Fourth, notice the irrefutability of Christ's miracles. These men hate Jesus so much that they want to put Him to death, and even still, they cannot deny that He is performing many mighty works. Even if they tried to deny it, they couldn't succeed because everyone has seen it for themselves. A multitude of people has ate of the fish and the loaves. They know that was a real miracle. There was a great crowd gathered around Lazarus' tomb when he comes out of the tomb. They know that man was dead, now he's alive. These works were irrefutable. I want to point to this because it's completely unlike the modern so-called miracle workers who only have stories to tell about the miracles that they have performed. And when there is video of the supposed miracle, it's something so ridiculous like lengthening someone's leg, which has actually been proven to be nothing more than a parlor trick. Brothers and sisters, make no mistake, God still works in mighty ways today. God still answers prayers. God still heals miraculously. God can still work through people. However, there, are no such, there is no such thing as a modern faith healer. There is no such thing as a person today who has the gift of miracles, who has the gift of healing. That does not exist anymore. It doesn't mean that God doesn't work. He does. But He has chosen now to work in a different way. If that did exist today, then even the enemies of this signs and wonders movement would have no choice but to concede they're performing miracles. I don't know how it's happening, but they're doing it because that's exactly what happened in Jesus' day. Even these people were not foolish enough to say, Jesus isn't actually performing a miracle. They know it's happening, and that's why they have to stop Him. But that's not happening today. Fifth, I want you to notice the hostility of the high priest. This is supposed to be the man who stands in the gap on the high holy day of atonement who goes into the holy place, the most holy place, and brings a sacrifice on behalf of the people. This, if anyone was supposed to be God's man, it's this man. But look at his hostility, verse 49. You know nothing at all. He's also rude to his fellow uh, members of the Sanhedrin. You, you guys don't know anything. You guys are fools. Nor do you understand that it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. In this sharp rebuke, the high priest is suggesting that they commit murder to save the rest of the nation. Do you see how dead the Jewish religion was at this time? Do you, do you see how empty it was? At this time in Jewish history, the office of the high priest was nothing like it used to be. One commentator noted that in New Testament times, the tenure of the high priest depended on the favor of the Roman government. It's kind of like we, we learned when we were watching the essential church. The people of God, God's institution, was subservient to the state. That's what was happening here. The high priest could serve so long as Caesar would allow him to serve. Think about that. As long as he made Caesar happy, you can be the high priest. Was Caesar, was there ever a Caesar who was a godly man? No, these guys were wicked, vile men. So what kind of high priest must you be to appease Caesar? Caiaphas served 18 years. That in itself tells you he made Caesar very happy. This is not a good guy. The state had control over the religious institution 
institutions of the day. And this is why they feigned fear that the Romans would come and take over their place if they don't stop Jesus. They viewed Jesus as a political threat. They thought he might try to incite an actual insurrection. At least they're claiming this is their thought. They know that this is a facade. They know that this is not his M.O. Caiaphas interjects here with a clear course of action that they need to take. Listen, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Let's quit messing around. Let's just go kill him. He needs to die so that we can survive. At this point, there is no other option in mind. It's settled. Jesus has just been sentenced to death by the high priest. This isn't just anybody. This is the man who would take, again, take the blood into the most holy place and pray for the forgiveness of his people. And he is the one that's saying, Jesus has to die. This is how wicked unbelief, the the wickedness of unbelief. From the outside looking in here, it might appear as though Jesus is just lost. It might appear to the leaders as though they they really just made an incredible plan that they will finally be done with Jesus. The nations have gathered together. The rulers have set themselves against the Lord and His anointed. So John helps us a little bit here and he zooms out to give us a small sample of the divine perspective. Look at the next verse, verse 51. This is the sixth observation I want to make here in this section is the sovereignty of God. Verse 51. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. In some mysterious, amazing way, God has just used Caiaphas and he didn't even know it. Caiaphas had no idea. John does not intend to say that Caiaphas knew that he received a word from the Lord to then say, hear the word of the Lord. Caiaphas is using his own words here. This is coming from his own heart. He wants Jesus dead. And what does God want? He wants to give his son as a ransom for many. God has just used Caiaphas in a way that is far beyond our understanding. John writes that he didn't say this of his own accord. Caiaphas didn't think he was talking about salvation when he spoke of Jesus dying in the place of another. Caiaphas thinks that he's saying, let Jesus die so that the Romans don't come here. Let's let our nation survive and let's let this man die. Let's kill him so that the Romans don't come and get us. We'll 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 offer him up to appease the state so that they will say, okay, good, you put that man down and they will leave us alone. But God had another plan. In the middle of the wickedness of Caiaphas, in the middle of this unjust, heinous meeting that is taking place, God is at work. God is using the words of a wicked man to proclaim what He is going to do. He's going to give His Son in place of the many. Only God can take what is meant for evil and use it for good. Only God can use people who think they are acting against Him for His own purpose. Do you see why the psalmist says that he who sits in the heavens laughs? You you guys don't even understand. You're playing right into my hand. Moreover, you're playing out exactly what my hand has proclaimed. The nations rage, the leaders plot in vain, but he who sits in heaven laughs. He holds them in derision. 
puny, fallen man. Thinks that he can overcome the strong arm of God and only ends up being used to accomplish God's will. This commentary that John gives us regarding the statement made by Caiaphas gives us a perfect illustration of the intersection between man's responsibility and the sovereignty of God. They, are, they both exist in some perfect unity that again is far beyond our perfect understanding. But somehow, God uses sinful people, even wicked people who are in rebellion against Him, to accomplish His perfect goals. This is power at a level that should just leave us absolutely in awe. We see it as far back as Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Do you remember Joseph? Do you remember what his brothers did to him? Terrible, terrible thing that they did to him. And what does Joseph say? As for you, you meant evil against me. God meant it for good. Friends, not that God saw what happened and reacted to it in a good and positive way. But that actually what was happening is that they were enacting God's plan. God does not react to situations. All of human history enacts God's plan. Nothing at any moment is ever outside of His perfect control. He is working even in the midst of great tragedy and turmoil. In the middle of it. Not after. Not after He's come up with a plan. He's using it in the middle of it. Exodus 9.16 to Pharaoh. For this purpose, God speaking, I have raised you up. What? God raised up Pharaoh. A wicked pagan. He raises him up. Why? To show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. It wasn't for the sake of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was nothing more than a pawn in God's grand plan. Isaiah 45, verse 1, God calls the wicked ruler Cyrus his servant. Why? Because he is a tool in the hand of God, accomplishing God's purposes. Friends, nowhere do we see this more clearly than in the unstoppable plan of God. Nowhere do we see his unstoppable plan more clearly than in salvation than in the Gospel, specifically than in Him sending His Son and His Son dying in the exact way that He did. Do you understand? This was not an accident. This was not happenstance. This didn't happen and then God had to figure out a way to make it work. This is exactly what God had ordained. Paul and Peter understood this very well. And in the first Christian sermon post Christ's ascension Acts 2:23 as he's proclaiming Christ Peter says this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men did God do it Or did they do it? Yes. They enacted God's plan. God is able to use even wicked people to accomplish His good purposes. I stress this to you because you and I will go through very difficult times this side of glory. And when we do, we need to be reminded of this truth right here. That God always brings about good out of evil. Even the most heinous evil. And if you ever doubt that, look to the cross. The greatest good was brought about from the greatest evil. An unjust, unrighteous plan is hatched here in this secret council 
and yet it is for God's purposes. You ought to ask yourself when you are in the midst of a situation that feels insurmountable, who is really in control here? Is it Satan? Is it this person who means me harm? Is it my illness? Is it my boss that won't let up? Is it the insurmountable whatever else it is? The answer is always no. It's God. He is in control. And from His view, everything is going according to plan. Even in the midst of of tragedy. If you are God's child, you are never outside of the safety of Romans 8.28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. All things work together for good. You are never outside of the safety of that promise. So from this moment forward, the religious leaders are in total agreement. They're going to put Jesus to death. And this is exactly God's plan. Let's finish with the search of Jesus. Search for Jesus. Jesus withdraws from public view in in verse 54. Even though the Sanhedrin had, had passed down the guilty verdict and sentenced Christ to death, he knows it is not yet time for him to lay down his life. He's not hiding in fear. This is his sovereignty. He is saying, you're not going to kill me yet. You'll kill kill me when I want you to. I'll lay down my life when it's time. You're not going to take it a second before it's time. He doesn't go away privately with the Jewish leaders, the people that you would think want to walk with God. He withdraws with his disciples. Undoubtedly, they had an important heartfelt conversations as he prepared his disciples for his departure. And while we don't have all of that recorded for us, we do have some of Christ's final teachings later on in John. As mentioned earlier, John gives us another time stamp here. The Passover is at hand. This is now the third Passover mentioned in this gospel in chapter 2. There's the first Passover, chapter 6 is the second one, and this is now the third one. So we know that John is covering at least two years, because those Passovers would cover the span of two years. At this Passover, John makes sure to mention that many of the Jews had made the pilgrimage up to Jerusalem to prepare themselves, to purify themselves. The Jews had to show up up early so that they could purify themselves from any ritual uncleanness. And so naturally, conversations are constantly being had among the people about whether or not Jesus is going to show up to this Passover. They all know the Pharisees have given orders that if anyone sees Jesus, they better tell on him. Go tell the Pharisees so that they can put him in jail. In reality, it's so that they can put him to death. We'll see in chapter 12 that Jesus will come to the Passover, but He comes on His own terms and on His own timing. You see, one of the important reasons that Passover is mentioned so frequently is because Jesus will be crucified on the day that they would slaughter the Passover lamb. Jesus is known as the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. In the mind of God, in His unsearchable brilliance, He has ordained for His Son, who is the Lamb, to be slaughtered on behalf of sinful men on the day that the Jews would celebrate the event that foreshadowed that exact moment. All of human history was designed to work out in such a way that it would lead to that exact moment. Jesus could not have been crucified one second before God had ordained. The nails could not have entered His hands. The blood could not have spilled. And Jesus could not have given up His Spirit one millisecond before God had planned it to be so. In other words, the greatest crime that was ever committed, the worst thing that any human has ever done, was used by God 
to bring about incredible good, namely the salvation of all of His people. As we prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's table, we ought to stand freshly amazed at God's unrelenting plan of salvation. How unstoppable His plan was. Nothing was going to get in His way from sending His Son exactly how and when He wanted to do so. God had ordained to give His Son as a ransom for us. We ought to be freshly humbled by the fact that we were in God's mind and heart before the world began and nothing could have stopped God from saving us. We ought to be reminded then as we partake of the elements of God's unfathomable grace towards us in Christ Jesus that He would ordain such tragedy, such humiliation, such suffering for you and for me so that we who are scattered abroad could be gathered together as God's children. Brothers and sisters, if God has so ordained for us to be saved, if even the schemes of powerful, wicked men could not stop God's plan to give us Christ, then nothing will stop Him from keeping you in Christ. Perhaps you're in here this morning and you've been wrestling with sin. I want you to stand in awe of how God has accounted for every single misdeed by every single sinner so that He could accomplish His plan. And I want you to see in that that He has accounted for every one of your sins as well. This is not an excuse for you to continue in that sin. But this morning, to cast that sin into the fountain of Christ's blood. To be reminded as we partake of the elements this morning that the body once given for you will not be taken back. That the blood spilled for you will not go back into His veins. He has given His life so that you can be forgiven. So let us come to the table then. And as we are reminded of what Christ has done for us, let us renew ourselves afresh to walking with Him. Would you please stand?